Hello and welcome. You're watching to the point. With just five days to go for voting in Maharashtra, India's second biggest state in electoral terms, the polls suggest that the BJP is far ahead of its rivals. But how do they view the outcome? That's the big question I shall put in part two to the Nationalist Congress Party leader, Praful Patel. But first, with ceasefire violations continuing, is there a danger that the situation could attract adverse international interest that doesn't suit India? Already the UN Secretary General and two US Senators have called for some form of UN involvement to facilitate talks. But beyond that, could the escalating tension also deter investors just when India has started to receive favourable attention? So tonight we ask, whilst Pakistan would welcome the world worrying about the situation in Kashmir, is there something India should think carefully about? And now joining me to discuss whether India's handling of the ceasefire violations is attracting adverse international attention are two former High Commissioners to Pakistan, Satyabrat Pad, who was there from 2006 to 2009, and Gopalaswamy Parthasarthi, who was there between February 1999 and May 2000. Also joining me from Kolkata, former Foreign Secretary Krishnan Srinivasan. Satyabrat Pal, the escalating ceasefire on the line of control and the international border has begun to attract international attention. First, the UN Secretary General expressed concern. Now, yesterday, two US senators have in a sense endorsed the need for the UN to play some role in facilitating talks. Clearly, these violations are beginning to slowly but perhaps steadily attract international attention. Does this suit India? Or is this something India should be perhaps anxious to avoid? Well, it's always been our policy to try to keep matters between India and Pakistan bilateral and not to attract international attention. And when the 2003 ceasefire was negotiated, we had two objectives in mind. One, of course, was to, to stop this incessant firing and to reduce civilian casualties. But equally, there was a political and, st uh, and strategic end in mind, uh, which was to ensure that we did not have the sort of international attention and the international pressure that was building up on both countries, which, which of course Pakistan welcomed and we absolutely did not. So any adverse internationalization of Kashmir, whether at the UN level or US senators or whatever, is something India wouldn't want and Pakistan would welcome? Uh, Pakistan, yeah, obviously, because whenever any such issue comes before the international community, there is a tendency to be even-handed. The fact that Pakistan might be the aggressor is then forgotten. Everyone wants two nuclear armed states to stop firing at each other. Mr. Parthasati, yesterday the Pakistan Defense Minister Khwaja Asif said, and I want to quote him, we don't want to convert the border tension between two nuclear neighbors into confrontation. And that's very cleverly reminding the world that Kashmir is a potential nuclear flashpoint. Today, the Pakistan National Security Council has formally announced that they will in fact draw the attention of what they call the top five countries. I presume they mean the permanent five at the UN Security Council, both to the Kashmir situation as well as the situation on the line of control. Is there a real sense in which our tough response is helping Pakistan play up this issue and internationalize it in a way we don't want? Look, this will continue to happen. Pakistan will ratchet up the tension and seek internationalization. But I think we've reached a stage where really that's not going to happen. Firstly, the UN Secretary General did not call for his direct involvement. He asked India and Pakistan to sort the matters out by talks between themselves. Uh, so so th that is very clear. Secondly, if you go back, even from the days of Kargil, uh, Bill Clinton invited uh, Mr. Vajpayee to join Nawaz Sharif at the White House and Mr. Mr. Uh, Vajpayee flatly said no. So that message has gone across very uh, loud and clear. The last bastion of support they had was the British Labour Party and the British Parliament has just uh, dropped it like a hot potato. So unlike Satyabrat Pal, mm. who was concerned about the internationalization that's happening and believes it's not in India's interest, mm. you're more sanguine about it. I am saying that everything depends on how you handle your international diplomacy. Nobody really wants to seriously touch this. But, but when and you say that, huh? are you suggesting that there's a little challenge now for Indian diplomacy? It's in always situation? been there. So what's new? Krishan Srinivasan, beyond the diplomatic concern, could increased international focus on Kashmir also put investors off just when Mr. Modi has attracted very favorable attention from Japan, from China, and of course, 
from a whole number of American CEOs. And again, would that be another cost for India, but not a cost for Pakistan? Yes, uh, I think you're quite right. I think uh, in, uh, in no respect uh, is this uh, conflict uh, on the, uh, uh, in JNK of benefit to us. Uh, first is the question of internationalization, which you mentioned. And second, of course, is it detracts from everything we're trying to do domestically. Uh, can I just uh, make one aside here? Uh, I mean, this is very refreshing news about the Nobel Peace Prize to Kailash Satyarthi and Malala Yousafzai. I think that's really a wonderful augury for better relations between the countries. Absolutely, except that it goes very differently. In fact, it goes in the opposite grain to what's happening actually between the two countries at the moment. Satya Pratpar, on the other hand, what about the view that a certain amount of international focus is unavoidable? If India is going to ensure that Pakistan stops repeated ceasefire violations, otherwise, if we are going to be so conscious and careful about not attracting adverse international attention, then we really can't take steps to check and stop Pakistan's behavior. One is a consequence of the other, and a certain amount of it we just simply have to grit our teeth and accept. Well, well look, uh, two countries like India and Pakistan uh, don't live in a bubble. So there will be international attention. The question is what sort of international attention? When there's normalcy at the line of control between 2000 to 2013 broadly there, 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 there was then the reality of, of the two countries sinks in then it's not, not two, two countries nuclear armed with the potential risk of things flaring up simply one country that is descending into failed state status and the other country taking off and therefore other states look at the situation objectively if you have a situation where things seem to be in danger of blowing up then all that is forgotten. All that you see are two people at each other's throats. And the international community then tries to do what it can to protect itself, which means they please calm down. So what you're saying is very important. You're saying the context in which international attention is drawn to Pakistan, uh, India, Pakistan and Kashmir and the LOC makes a critical difference to the impact of that Absolutely. international attention. It has to be on our terms, not on theirs. At the I moment it's on their terms. So at the moment, any successful attempt to draw attention is against India's interests. That, I, I maintain that. And you're also therefore by corollary saying that if our response to Pakistani ceasefire violations is leading to an opportunity for Pakistan to internationalize the issue, then perhaps our response is the wrong one because it's working ultimately against our interests. Th th that is what I would hold. Uh, I, I take Partha's point that it is unlikely to lead on uh, to any, any huge pressure or oppression that we find insupportable but it will still be an inconvenience it will still be a distraction and it will still cause those, those those distractions from Mr. Modi's agenda that you spoke about in other words before I go to Mr. Parthas then let me ask you one further question are you saying that the tough response that we are now giving the Pakistani or Mr. Jaitley's language the consequences and the costs will be made unaffordable that in a sense perhaps that may play very well to a domestic audience but in terms of diplomacy and India's foreign policy interests, it's a mistaken response. Uh, absolutely. I mean, again, uh, if, we, if, if you remember what happened, happened in 2002 uh, with, with Operation Parkram, uh, Pakistan's economy grew by 2% that year, ours shrunk by 2%, simply because Pakistan depends on foreign aid, which continued to grow, and ours depends on, a, on, on, on trade and uh, foreign investment and foreign tourism. Which suffered? Which completely sh uh, went down the tubes. Well, that's a very different view to the one that you took a moment ago. How do you want to reply to Satya Bhattar, who's essentially saying that if you follow a policy in response to Pakistani cease violations that allows Pakistan to internationalize it, mm -hmm. then you draw attention in a way that Pakistan could benefit, but India very definitely will not. Let me put it this way. Pakistani misbehavior is a, is a given. It doesn't mean you don't respond. I'll go along with Sato to one point. If you go back to Kargil, we never opened our mouth. We did what we had to do. So there was no need for strident rhetoric. Do what you have to do. Throw the fellows out. If necessary, shell them heavily, which is what we did in the Neenam Valley between 2000 and 2002. Can I interrupt? And no, no, just a minute. You are always interrupting. Between 2000 and 2003, that's what we did. 
and that is what forced Musharraf when they we and he couldn't move a, 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 an inch in the Neelam Valley there's, there's to ask for a ceasefire. There's a very interesting point you made that I want to draw you out on. Mm. You said there was no need for strident rhetoric. Mm. You pointed out in particular that when Kargil happened, when mm. we were actually invaded, which hasn't happened at the moment, mm. there was no strident rhetoric. Are you therefore suggesting mm. that the language from Radhanath Singh Pakistan ko samajhna chahiye ki Bharat mein zamana badal gaya or the language from Jaitley mm -hmm. we will make the cost unaffordable that that sort of language is strident and unfortunate I think from from their point of view they were signaling both to the Pakistanis and to their own people that we are not UPA not that the UPA did not in certain occasions act tough when they had to but the fact of the matter is that uh, let's see how it goes now but that I've answered my question, is the language from Rajnath and Jaitley unfortunate? Their compulsions are both domestic and international. They have to make it very clear that when our citizens are dying, we intend to. So respond. now suddenly, whereas in Kargil you said and you appreciated that there was no strident rhetoric here, you're quite happy for strident no, rhetoric. No civilians were dying in Kargil. The army There's, was. The, army uh, soldiers. Ar were. Army, so, army soldiers. 480 of them. Uh, uh, yes, and 1,000 on the other side. So that's acceptable. But, but that, is, that is military fight, fighting right. and doing their job. Krishna we killed. have a very interesting situation here in studio. Both gentlemen are former Indian High Commissioners to Pakistan. Satya Pratpal has very cogently argued that any Indian response to Pakistani ceasefire violations which allows Pakistan to internationalize the situation will ultimately work against India's interests and in Pakistan's favor. And he pointed out how, in fact, when these things happen, uh, trade suffers, uh, investment flows to India suffer. Pakistan doesn't lose because it only depends on aid. You've heard the almost opposite from G. Parthasarthi with a small corollary which afterwards he backed off that strident language is not a good thing but he seems to have accepted strident language at the moment. Where do you as a former foreign secretary stand? I have not issue? accepted. I said I don't know the compulsions. Don't put words right. in my mouth. You don't know the compulsions. Where do you as a former foreign secretary stand on this very interesting division of opinion? I think it's almost certain that uh, any kind of conflict in JNK is going to be internationalized and it's not in our interest and it's in our interest to keep these frozen conflicts as they call them uh, to an absolute minimum. I think that uh, a robust response was appropriate and I think has been probably given but I think there had to be a plan B and that plan B obviously has to be yeah. about talking to Pakistan. You, you can't just let the situation go on day after day after day without any kind of alternative plan as to how to de-escalate it. I, I was very disappointed that uh, it seemed to me that uh, the rhetoric was getting out of control. Uh, when you say it's unaffordable, at what stage do you decide that it's unaffordable? I think that I would have liked to have seen diplomacy come into the picture much quicker and I'd like to see us engage with Pakistan on numerous uh, aspects, okay. including BNK, as often and as vigorously as possible. Two questions flow out of your answer and I'm going to put them to you one by one. First of all, when you s comment on the use of that word unaffordable, are you saying that that sort of language from the Defence Minister should have been avoided? Well, who is going to judge that? I mean, we, uh, obviously, I think today we find that uh, uh, the, uh, the firing has diminished. Maybe it will come to an end, hopefully, in which case we, shall, we can move on to consolidating a ceasefire on better lines perhaps than 2003. But who is to judge what is afford unaffordable and when? So I think that what I was really trying to say was while a robust response was necessary and was probably given, we should have moved much more quickly to uh, discussions. Now that's the it second question. It need not have been discussions at uh, the, sorry, yes. So that, that takes me straight to my second question which is at the, the end of the day, yes. at the end of the day India's robust response is intended to ensure de-escalation. But can that desired yes. de-escalation happen without some form of talks? even if those talks only happen between commanders at the border. Because at the moment, yes. if sources are to be believed, India has ruled out even flag meetings on the border. Do you think that is well, a mistaken I, I would, idea? Uh, candidly, I would, I would prefer the talks to be diplomatic and not between the two armies. I, I would far have preferred, we do have an embassy, uh, a high commission in Pakistan. They do have a 
High Commission here. There are many other forms of contact possible also. The foreign minister can pick up the phone and speak to somebody in Pakistan. I would prefer to have moved this away from uh, the army to army contact or BSF to rangers contact and move it to the diplomatic arena where ultimately a solution has to be found anyway. That's very interesting. What you're hearing the former foreign secretary clearly say is that he would have liked a more active plan B. He's not actually saying plan B doesn't exist, but certainly it's not being used. And the plan B he'd have liked is not just talks at the troop commander level on the board of flag meetings or whatever they're called, but diplomatically, minister to minister, foreign secretary to foreign secretary. That level of contact communication, that effort clearly hasn't been made by the Indian side. We've robustly responded by getting our troops to fire happily with Mr. Modi saying that the real response is the finger on the trigger. But the sort of response the Foreign Secretary wanted, diplomats talking, politicians talking, hasn't happened. Do you think that suggests that the handling by the Modi government of this whole episode is not as adept and not as uh, certain and confident as it should have been? No, on, on, on this, uh, I think, uh, at, at, at this stage, talking to the civilians would not help, simply because the civilians aren't the ones uh, who are, as it were, who have their hands, their fingers on the trigger. Uh, at the moment, you need to diffuse the situation at the border uh, and at the line of control. And we, we, we shouldn't forget that exactly this happened in October 2013, exactly a year back. And it was clearly then the, the Pakistani army signaling to Mr. Nawaz Sharif that he shouldn't go overboard in trying to make peace with India. And if it's happening now again, without any apparent provocation, it simply means that after what happened in New York, perhaps the signals that Mr. Sattar Jaziz said that the timing of the Pakistan High Commissioner's talks with the Hurriyat were unfortunate, was, un was unfortunate, that the Pakistani army is worried that a chink might be opening up again and which they want to shut. So clearly they will not, they will not accept diplomatic talks. But it's in our interest, exactly as it did in October 2013, when again the BSF was given carte blanche uh, to, to use mortars and heavy machine guns against the Pakistanis, but we also had the DGM was talking on the hotline. But there's a very interesting beginning to your answer. Earlier your views were conflicting with Mr. Parthasarthi sitting to your right. Now you're also disagreeing with Krishnan Srinivasan, the former foreign no. secretary, on the point that he'd have liked a more active plan B, which is at the diplomatic and political level, working side by side. What I'm saying is that at the moment we need the plan A, which is, as it were, an emergency service to work, which is a flag meeting. Okay. Let me put this to you. you there is no doubt in that answer from Mr. Satyabhat Pal that he believes that the Pakistan army is doing this consciously and deliberately and their intention is to scupper any attempt by the Nawaz government to start talks. They did it in October 2013, shortly after he took over. They're doing it again now, he says, because the Zaj disease may have opened a window, they want to make short shot. Are you equally confident that this is in fact the Pakistan army? Let me put you another thought. Even at the height of Kargil, there was a back channel going. Two days ago, Mr. Modi at an Air Force reception, the Prime Minister, says this will be sorted out. What made him so confident? And why, and even if there is a back channel, like we had in Kargil, I can say now, we didn't talk about it. So, I mean, let's not pass judgment. This is why I'm saying I'm not willing to pass judgment. Because in conflict situations, even if you go when back you to... When you say don't pass judgment, are you suggesting that you don't agree with Satya? No, I'm saying when you pass judgment, not Sato. The, uh, the fact of the matter is that even in the Bangladesh conflict, Jagjeevan Ram as defense minister was speaking in a different tone from Indira Gandhi, the prime minister. Right now in these situations, you do have, yes, somebody voicing strident statements, but there are back channels. Mm, but go back, go back to the situation and the role of the Pakistan army because that's where we... Yes, began. I'm, I'm coming, 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 huh. coming, to, coming to it. The Pakistani army cools off only when it gets a thrashing. That is the only lesson it understands. And therefore, when that, uh, when, when that was process was completed in Kargil, and it was uh, more or less heading in that direction, and here it was okay. worse. The army was not involved. Okay. Let it was the Rangers. The Pakistan army only learns a lesson when it gets a thrashing. I think those are word for word, a correct recapitulation of what he said. 
How far down that road do you agree with him? Well, the Pakistani army is obtuse. Uh, I think military intelligence is a contradiction in terms that applies to the Pakistani <laughs> army as much as to any, a, any other army. But in this case, I think they do have a very clear idea of what their very limited objectives are, which is to stop any attempt at a rapprochement for a number of reasons. It's too complex to go And there they've succeeded. There they've succeeded. By the way, if you knew that this was their intention, there must have been a very sizable section of South Bloc who would have known this was their intention. Did we, therefore, by taking a robust response and behaving the way we did with our rhetoric, play into the hands of the Pakistan army rather than find a way of supporting the civilians who are more keen to do business with us? Again, is that another area where you have question marks about how the Modi government has handled this? Well, on, on, on that, I would agree with you, and I, I, I mm. think I, I would disagree with Martha that yes, indeed. Uh, but, but again, uh, I suppose exactly as in 2013, uh, when you have uh, provocations of the sort at the international border, not just as a line of control, there is pressure. Yeah. Krishna Shri oh, we don't have that line to Krishna Srinivas in Calcutta. Unfortunately, the line is down. Let me then bring up a, a qu question that tries to assess overall how the Modi government has handled this episode. Has it been adept or has it been perhaps a little too gung-ho? Has it played too much to the domestic audience and forgetting that there is an international audience that we have to keep in mind as well? Yes, I think that the main difference between October 2013 and this year uh, is that it's the nature of the statements that are being made. And there I really think, um, well, it's as, as Partha said, I mean, people speak in different voices, but we haven't heard a different voice so far. I suppose when he says the real difference between October 2013 and now is the nature of the statements. What he's really saying is that on both occasions, the Pakistan army was deliberately provoking clashes. Mm. Dr. Manmohan Singh was deliberately more restrained in his response because he had one clear eye on the impact that would have on investments and the wider economy. Mm. Mr. Modi's government seems to be less concerned about that. Do you welcome the change in attitude or are you a little apprehensive? Look, I don't think this is going to affect investments and economic growth. This is a passing phase and we will move on. But the more, the more important thing is, Manmohan Singh, yes, which is not very well known, acted very decisively after the beheadings, robustly I would say, but he lost an election. Yeah, he, his, his words, if you call that robust, was to say it, the army chief's tea party on army day, it can't be business no, 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 as no, usual. No, 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 yes. But that's about all he said. Yes, says. yes, but that's, about, that's, that's, all, sufficient. that's all the point that needed to be said. But uh, would, 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 would you have preferred that form of language, which was somewhat elliptical, rather than Arun Jaitley, who was much more blunt? I told you, defense ministers and prime ministers talk on different tones. Uh, that has been the case you're with Chavan in 65. You're being pretty elliptical yourself. We've got, that's been the case with we've got Krishna Srinivasan back with us. My apologies, Mr. Srinivasan. <laughs> we lost the line to Kolkata a moment ago. That could possibly be because you're heading towards a cyclone in that city and the weather is getting a bit a awkward. We're talking about overall impressions of the way the Modi government has handled this episode over the last 10-12 days. Given the nature of the language from the Home Minister and the Defence Minister, given the robust military and BSF response, given the fear that this is fed into Pakistan's capacity to internationalise the issue, which doesn't suit our interests, taking all of that into account, would you say as a former Foreign Secretary that the government's handling has been, been adept and sure-footed? Or would you say it's somewhat mishandled? Well, I know that um, uh, my colleagues have been speaking about uh, the subtlety of various voices coming from the Indian government. I'm not sure with the, whether this is not over subtle. I think it tends to confuse uh, 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 the uh, uh, foreign governments who are perhaps keeping a very close eye on the situation. It might even confuse uh, uh, the Pakistani across the border. But perhaps we're, we're giving a little too much credit for this subtlety. I think that, uh, you know, candidly speaking, it's a bit too early to judge whether this has been handled well or not. If, it ha is, if the firing is diminishing uh, and the firing from Pakistan is said to have diminished today, I think we would all be extremely happy and we would say that the government in New Delhi has been quite successful. Of course, we'll hear a different story altogether from the Pakistani side, no doubt. But I think that it's much too early to tell, Karan. We'll have to wait a little bit longer okay. for the dust to settle and hear what the story is from the other side as well. 
Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, one of my questions, I think it was to Mr. Parthasarthi, the Pakistan National Security Council, which met earlier today, has announced formally that they will, in fact, be petitioning, I think that is the word, the five top countries, who I presume are the permanent five of the UN Security Council, mm -hmm. and raising both Kashmir and the line of control. Is there something we need to do in response to ensure that uh, our interests with those countries are not somehow diminished? Well, we always have been in touch with uh, permanent members. We've been in touch with all the important governments across the world on our point of view on Kashmir. That's not going to change. And uh, obviously, we have to, uh, to uh, press our case uh, very strongly again with the facts and figures available. But in the end, any resolution, any settlement, temporary or permanent, is going to be in India and between India and Pakistan. And so I think that uh, there is a limit to which foreign intervention also can, can be uh, sustained okay. or can be effective. All right, gentlemen, I think we're going to have to leave this particular one there. My thanks to both of you for coming to the studio. My thanks to Krishna Srinivasan for joining us from Calcutta. Once again, apologies for that collapse of the OB. I think that is entirely because of bad weather at your end.